On today's episode of Alt Cinema, we're going to be beginning a new series called Botched Restorations. And what Botched Restorations is about is taking a look at those films which have enormous historic import, have been through an extensive restorations, and have somehow come out on the other end of that restoration less than they were before they went in. Now, this is a very rare grouping of films because most of the time, the restorations that films go through is not only extensive, it's wonderful. It's taken things that used to be existent only in the most primitive and beaten up prints and given us an ability to see them perhaps even better than they looked on their initial releases. But there are certain cases where that restoration has gone awry. One of the largest examples of that is 1954's A Star is Born, featuring Judy Garland. Now, the whole story behind that film became necessary for restoration is not a happy one. The filming itself was made in 1953 and 1954. Judy Garland had ignominiously left MGM under a wave of bad publicity uh, and a suicide attempt. She had then triumphantly reemerged in a series of concerts, including one at the palace. So her star had indeed magically been reborn. So what better project to do than a star is born? This was of course, before it became widely known how dangerous it was to do an adaptation of a star is born. For example, the original film, What Price Hollywood, which featured Constance Bennett. Her career ultimately didn't go very far after that. Janet Gaynor's version of A Star is Born wound up being Gaynor's last film, period. The Judy Garland A Star is Born meant to restart her career, instead cemented her legend as someone who never seemed to catch the right kind of break, yet nonetheless went on and uh, performed magnificently through her defeats. The Barbara Streisand A Star is Born served as a separation between those fans who loved her for just being a great performer to her fans being fairly exclusively Barbara Streisand maniacs without really going beyond that and, and being part of the mainstream anymore. Fortunately, that's still a large number, but that film was still a watershed for that. It remains to be seen what happens with Lady Gaga's version, but I'm going to suspect that that one might not fall into this curse, but we'll never know until Lady Gaga actually has a successful film career afterwards. Anyway, going back to the Judy Garland one, 1953 and 1954 also saw her uh, under the impresario of Sid Luft. Now, Sid Luft is a very controversial figure in the history of Garland, because on the one hand, he saw in her the enormous potential, the enormous ability she had to keep on going, the enormous fan base that she had installed who would forgive her for anything, quite literally anything. And he decided to capitalize on it. There are others who say he was nothing but a, a con man who happened to have been yet another in the long line of men who had latched on to Garland to write their meal tickets. I suspect that uh, the, the truth is somewhere in between, but I tend to be a supporter of Luft because he was the most consistent figure in her life and is responsible for reams of archival material on Garland. Anyway, A Star is Born was picked up by Warner Brothers, who was a little bit hesitant about working with Garland, but Luft insisted that she would be fine. In order to make that better, they brought on veteran director George Cukor, who was known as being a, a, a director who had an especial elan with female performers and, and, and had an ability to coax some of their best performances out of them. Well, my heart goes out to him because he tries. He does try. But I hate him for failing. I hate me too. 
I hate me because I failed to. I am. In all honesty, by the time the film finished production, Cukor swore he would never work with her again or with Luft because they were both nightmarish and, and completely undisciplined. And Cukor was someone who insisted on discipline. But while the traumas that were going on behind the scenes were bad and intense, what ended up on the screen was very good. And Cukor working with his, his, his team, which included, um, uh, which, which included Moss Hart writing the screenplay, they all decided to give a very unique look at Hollywood. It was a Hollywood that never existed in the real world. It was a never, never land where you still had the Coconut Grove uh, award ceremonies intermixed with the world of television. So the era was never specifically correct in one way or another, but that sort of lent to its universality. Its production numbers, the, the central one in particular, the Born in a Trunk number, was one that was modeled a lot on American in Paris using modernist art forms, which to many modern eyes makes that number look particularly scrappy. I, I happen to think it still looks great, but it, it does indeed rest entirely on Garland's star-making persona. I was born in a trunk in a princess theater in Pocatello, Idaho. It was he was also faced with a bunch of challenges. For example, even though she was only 31 and 32 years old during the production of the film, Garland looked a mess. She did not look good at all. So they tried all sorts of different makeup. And you'll notice that in the continuity of the film, there's many sequences where she has a much more elderly look to her. And ironically, some of those scenes are at the very beginning of the film. So it's, it's rather odd to watch it because of those, those, those variations. And the chief number of the film where Garland sings, The Man That Got Away, notoriously was filmed three times before they finally came up with the final version, which I believe is one of the great musical moments on film. It's all in one shot. And you watch Garland absolutely controlling the band. There's just no let up the live long night and day. Now, one would think with all of these good things going into the movie, especially after its torturous production, that it would be a, ma a major hit. But the film had a problem, and that problem was the Born in a Trunk number. Yes, it is a great piece. Yes, it does feature Garland singing a number of old tunes, including Swanee, and absolutely knocking it out of the park. It also comes in the middle of the movie and sits like a gigantic rock in the middle of it. Not only that, the story is very unsurprising. And in fact, it's told at extraordinary length. And because of that, even though audiences were enthusiastic about Garland, the running time was wearing them down. And not only that, it was such a downer. The film does a good job of blending the old school versions of the musical with the new styles that came in with film noir and was especially innovative because it was shot in CinemaScope and Cukor refused to live by the limitations of what you were supposed to shoot in CinemaScope. So that means there's several moments in it where the compositions are odd, to say the least, disconcerting to say others. Do you know the only thing I can think of right now, the only thought that comes into my mind the way I wash my hair. <laughs> you see, when anything happens to me, good or bad, I make straight for the shampoo bottle. This was before a lot of these aesthetics had been worked out. Nonetheless, the fact that he was trying to make it work uh, was, was a good thing. However, that 
running time was an issue. And theaters started to complain because you could only have one or two showings during the prime evening hours. And the movie, because it was so long, was having a very great difficulty with the definite recommends. There were people who just felt it was too much. And I got to tell you, they weren't necessarily wrong. So Jack Warner responded to that by ordering cuts to be made in the movie. Now the film was already out there. So to go out there and to actually pull the film back and re-edit it carefully the way Cukor said he could have might sound good on paper, but let's face it, it was already out there. It was already a troubled picture. You pull it back, pull it out of release, and you are telling people that there's something wrong with this thing, that it's too damn long, and you're having to do something to it to make it all better. Uh, can we say you might as well just pull it now and call it a day? It, it, it'll become a lost leader. So he did what was the second best thing, which is he sent out the word of certain cuts that they wanted to make with it. Now, obviously, these were going to be cuts that were made by the local film exchanges. So there wasn't going to be any opportunity to go in there and finesse them. These were fairly blunt. Cut here, cut here, cut here. And then send the footage back to us as, as, as soon as possible. We're going to destroy it to, to destroy the memories that, that there was this other stuff. Ronald Havar, in his book, about A Star is Born talks a lot about this, about how there were people who would complain initially about the fact that the film was different. And the studio even pulled a couple of stunts on people where they would show the cut version and the uncut version and, and, and convinced people that they were insane. This was not a smart move, by the way, which shows you that Warner Brothers has always had this tendency to do unsmart things. But anyway, they, they ended up basically cutting every single print that was out there. Now, for years, there had been stories about film fans grabbing the trims and outtakes from these exchanges. And we all know that happened because it's not as if these film exchanges were necessarily careful about what they did, necessarily followed the edicts that were coming from the studio. Most of the time they'd say, yeah, we'll get around to it. You put it in a box, you put it in the basement and it stays there. So for decades, there was this feeling that that footage existed somewhere. And Warner Brothers looking at A Star is Born because in its cut form, now you had audiences going, I'm not gonna go see this movie because it's cut up. So now you've, you've turned a bad situation into an unsolvable one. You, you've, you've shortened the movie. It's now a failure. Now the word is out there that Judy Garland's comeback didn't really work, at least within the industry. Doesn't matter if she was nominated for an Academy Award. Warner Brothers was so angry with her that they did no publicity for her. So it was a shock that there was no shock that Grace Kelly wound up winning that year for The Country Girl for you know, it's an okay performance, but it's certainly not one that became iconographic the way Garland's did throughout uh, the long history since then. So over time, A Star is Born showed up on TV and it started developing an even greater cult following. And if you think about it, this is pretty darn amazing considering that the versions that were on TV were pan and scanned in the most clumsy way possible with uh, not even the, the smooth scooting and, and, and panning that Fox would do on its films, but just straight cuts, sometimes from one side of the screen to the other. And I mean, they just uh, talk about making a mess of, of, of the compositions and, and even the storytelling stuff. But on TV, people didn't care. And they weren't about to watch Letterbox. It's not as if your TV was enormous. And so you Letterbox and all of a sudden you don't see people's faces. So, so that was a compromise. It was a bad one, but people felt there was no choice. And short of doing what they did with Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and shoot the whole thing twice, they weren't about to do that. So anyway, you have, the, uh, you, you have the film starting to build a following, especially because it had been, even in its butchered version, 154 minutes. So in most markets, they would take that 154 minute movie and cut it down even further to a two hour time slot, which means it'd be about 92 to 95 minutes uh, with, with, with not, not without the commercial breaks. So most of the numbers disappeared and, 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 and 
the numbers that remained became so tantalizing that, that there became a clamor. Ron Haver made it his life's mission to try to restore the film. And he, in, in spite of the initial pushback, because again, Warner Brothers not interested in a failure and in, in, in trying to restore a failure. And, and in spite of all that, he finally lobbied the right people and they agreed to let him look in their libraries and their archives. And in the process of doing that, they found a lot of unexpected gems. For example, they found a monorail mix of the entire soundtrack no picture to go with it, but the entire monorail mix. They also found a lot of the footage that had been part of the trims and outtakes of, of, of the film and uh, that, that were used for stock footage. Truck, uh, uh, buses moving in and out, uh, the, the James Mason scenes where he was on a boat outside. So, so you had a lot of pieces here and there. Plus you had test reels that would, would, would show up of, 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 of bad takes that just happen to appear here and there. Good evening. Well, what's good to eat today? Well, we have cheeseburgers, nut burgers, banana burgers, chicken burgers, lobster burgers, tuna burgers, chopped suey burgers, and our own special super duper super burger. Well, what's in that? Everything in the place, all burgered. But the holy grail still remained an uncut version of the film. And for a while there, there was word that Warner Brothers had found somebody who had not only a complete print of A Star is Born, but a lot of other rarities in the Warner Brothers library. And this is where the story gets very controversial and not necessarily coherent. So who knows what the truth is? But there was a, 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 a tale of how Haver had, had made a deal with one of the people who allegedly had a complete print and they agreed to meet. At, uh, near the Warner Brothers. And this person as a collector was really worried because he didn't trust Warner Brothers, but Haver insisted that this would be okay. So the guy shows up, not bringing a star is born. He wasn't stupid. And sure enough, the Warner Brothers attorneys deciding, we don't care what Ron Haver says, these people have stole our stuff. We're not gonna mention they threw it away and this person just picked it up out of the garbage, right? So they arrested him. So sure enough, any hope of putting together the entire film went away. Nonetheless, over time, Haver was able to find two more missing numbers and a whole host of sequences. This is all good. However, Haver was determined to try to restore the film to what it used to be. So what they did is during the about 20 minutes of footage that was missing, they went in and used some of George Cukor's stills that were taken on, on, on the set. And they animated those stills and um, sort of kind of matched it with the soundtrack that they had, as well as the little bits and pieces. And so they reconstructed those sequences. And this is where the trouble for A Star is Born begins. Because in all honesty, even though Cukor would never forgive Jack Warner, although he would work for him again, obviously he did My Fair Lady for him, even though he would never really forgive him for what he did with um, A Star is Born, he still got a chance to see this restored version and he was apparently very thrilled with it, especially because it had those missing sequences. However, he wasn't necessarily thrilled with the still photographs because he understood that even though he feels that some of these early sequences did indeed build the character between James Mason and Judy Garland, the film itself really was too long. So now you put these developmental sequences back in with still photographs might be interesting for academics. It might be interesting for Judy fans. It might be interesting for historians of all sorts. But for the general public, it's a huge minus. Uh, one of my former professors, who I'm still friends with 40 years later, showed A Star is Born to his cinema class. And while they were impressed with the movie and while they were impressed with Garland, they couldn't stand it. 
And we're talking about a room of 300 people. And these aren't 300 people who say, I hate old movies. I can't stand black and white. No, these are cinema students who were prone to liking this type of material. Now, they couldn't take it because the movie at three hours is really a trudge. And the fact that Warner Brothers hadn't shortened it initially before the initial release is really on them. And it should have been on QCOR as well to make some of the trims that were needed before it got released. But I bet you they were up against a deadline. So they didn't have a choice but to throw it out there as best they could. And, and, and then when they fixed it, unfortunately, the word got out there and then no one wanted to see it. But now we have a version of the film that no one wants to see. I'm willing to bet that, 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 the, that most of the people who will indulge in the Blu-ray or the DVD, by the way, the Blu-ray looks spectacular, of, of, of the film, nonetheless, don't watch it from end to end. It is too much of a trudge. It is quite literally insufferable. Now, I'm someone who loves Garland. I'm someone who actually loves this movie. And, and, and for me to say that I will not willingly watch it from end to end uh, is saying something. I mean, I can sit there and watch, I could go on singing with no problem or, or, or any of her other films, but this one I won't because it's, it's so heavy. It's so, uh, it, it, it throws you out so cataclysmically at the beginning that you never hook into the movie again. You never get emotionally involved with it. You become someone who appreciates it for what Haver did, but you're not watching the film in the way that a true audience must in order for a film to maintain its longevity beyond merely the historic. So because of the fact that that's the only version of the film that exists today, it's the only way you can watch it. We now have an artifact of A Star is Born that while a lot of people still consider it the best of the versions, while a lot of people will still talk about it in the sense of how it's a savaged masterpiece. The bottom line is for bringing in newcomers who are not already part of the Judy or the George Q Corps or the James Mason or, or the installed fan base, we have an artifact that no one will want to partake of. And that's one of the great tragedies of Hollywood. Don't give in to a friend. Turn out friend.